complain for all my hope you is your name and now your joy awaits my praise I give thanks for all you have done and I will sing of your mercy and your love your love is unfailing Lord I am grateful When I was down, you brought me out. You set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand. You are my God. Your faithfulness, my solid rock. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. I give thanks for all you have done. I won't forget all the battles that you've won. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I am grateful. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let our lives declare the love of God has spoken over us. And as we lift our hands, the heavens open, heavens open. So let won't forget all the battles that you've won your love is unfailing lord i am grateful You came from heaven's throne, acquainted with our sorrow, to train the dead we owe, your suffering for our freedom, the Lamb of God in my place your blood poured out my sin erased it was my death you died i am raised to life hallelujah the lamb of god my 
my name upon your heart. My shame upon your shoulders. The power of sin undone. The cross for my salvation. The Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out my sin erased he was my death you died i am raised to life hallelujah the lamb of god there is no greater love there is no greater love the savior lives no greater love there is no greater love there is no greater love the Savior lifted up there is no greater I'll sing that out. There's no greater love. There is no greater love. There is no greater love. The Savior lifted up. There is no greater love. The Lamb of God in my place, your blood poured out my sin, he raised, he was my death, you died, I am raised to life, hallelujah, the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out my sin. He raised, he was my death. You died, I am raised to life. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. The Lamb of God. The Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out my sin. He raised, he was my death. You died, I am raised to life. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. Yes, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your sacrifice for us, Lord. We worship you this morning. You're worthy of honor and praise, Lord. So we pour out our praise on you. Let it be a sweet sound in your ear this morning, Lord. It's Jesus. You are worthy, Lord. You are worthy. The Lamb of God in my place. Your blood poured out my sin. He raised, it was my death. You died, I am raised to life. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. It was my cross you bore so that I can live in the freedom you died for. And now my life is yours and I will sing 
of your goodness forevermore. And worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. And now my shame is gone. I stand amazed in your love undeniable. Your grace goes on and on, and I will sing of your goodness forevermore. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Come on, church. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. The name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Be exalted now in the heavens as your glory fills this place. You alone deserve our praise. You're the name above all names. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. Worthy is your name, Jesus. You deserve the praise. Worthy is your name. I trust this morning that you sense the presence of the Lord where you are. 
as much as we sense the presence of the Lord where we are. God is in this place. God is with you. And God is giving us the opportunity to call upon his name and to just give praise and honor and glory unto him. And so let's do that this morning as we go to the Lord in prayer. Let's just vocally, audibly give God glory and honor and praise for which he is so worthy to receive. Father, we come before you and truly we glorify your name. We give you praise and honor and glory that you are worthy to receive. For worthy is the Lamb and truly, Lord Jesus, we can know that you are in the place. You inhabit the praises of your people and that we can know that you are here, that you are wherever your people are in their homes or wherever they might be, that God, you are there. And you have given us the invitation to come boldly before the throne of grace, that we might obtain mercy and find grace to come in times of need. And we bring our request before you. Lord, we know that you are a loving God. You know our needs even before we ask them. But in spite of that, we bring them to you. We cast them at your feet. And we ask God that you would just take every need that is represented, whatever the need might be, that you would minister to the needs and that you would just reach down and touch hearts and lives in this time together this morning. We thank you, Lord, for this privilege that you have given us. And now all that we can say, Lord, is that you would be glorified, that you would be exalted, and that we, as your people, might be blessed. And so, Lord, we just offer unto you all praise, honor, glory, and adoration. And we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you're doing. And we thank you for what you are going to do. And we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. While the presence of the Lord is upon this place, 
And I trust and I pray that you are sensing God's presence in your life right now as much as we are in the sanctuary. Even though we are separated, we know that God's presence is with us because he is a God who is present everywhere. Where you are is where he is. And so I trust you feel and you sense that presence of God right now in your place where you might be. God is a great God. We had a great time last week in our parking lot service, and I believe that we reached a number of people that don't attend our church, and we are so thankful for what God is giving us the opportunity to do. You know, a lot of times we see things happening in life, and we don't know why these things happen. But I think of Joseph, and Joseph said, you know, guys, you meant evil against me, but God meant good. And I think good is coming out of the situations that we have faced, and, and Sunday was a great representation of that. We do want to remind you, next Sunday we are going to open the church, and we want to invite you to come and be a part of the service with us. Service is at 10 o'clock. We will have some restrictions, of course, but we want to encourage you to come. And if you are compromised in any way, we would encourage you to stay home and be, view the service by online, but be safe in whatever you can, and let's just enjoy what God is going to do. I'll have some announcements as far as things that we will be looking at as the day comes to be in. So let's be thankful for God's grace, God's blessing, and God's peace upon our lives. This morning I want to share with you a message that is very pertinent in life and the situations that we are confronting even in our day and age in which we are now living. I remember as a child, you know, going to Sunday school and all my life I've spent in church, I've been in Sunday school all of my life and I remember some of the stories that were told in our children's church time and our Sunday school time and, and the impression those things left in my heart. I remember the story of Jonah and the big fish. And what a remarkable tale. And I thought, how in the world could a fish be so large that we, he would swallow Jonah? But the Bible says it happened, and it did happen. And then I think of the one that I want to be referring today, and that is the, the obstacle that David had one time in his life by the name of Goliath. We all know the story of David and Goliath and what transpired that day. But you know the thing that I am so impressed about with the Word of God is, is the Word of God is powerful. And it is for today, and it is for yesterday, and it will be for tomorrow. You see, the things of the Old Testament are so pertinent into our lives today. And when we look at the life of David and Goliath, we can pick out some things in that account that bring great application into our lives in the day and the age in which we live. This morning I'll be looking at a text taken from 2 Samuel or 1 Samuel chapter 17. We'll be looking at verses 4 through 11, and then we'll be jumping down to verses 41 through 51. But I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you have ever had a Goliath in your life? You know that, you, you, that thing that is so real and so pertinent, so large in your life, that person that maybe has a way of getting under your skin, and he becomes that Goliath, or maybe a circumstance that comes into your life and it scares you to death. It worries you, it overwhelms you. In fact, it even goes to the extent of keeping you awake at night and you toss and you turn because you cannot get by the thoughts and the intensity of the issues that you may be facing. That's a Goliath that you may have in your life. Maybe it's a health issue that doesn't look very positive. The prognosis doesn't sound favorable, and so it's something that is weighing on you, and, and you don't know what the outcome is going to be. You don't know the in-between, and so it becomes an overwhelming situation. It becomes a Goliath. Or maybe it's a financial situation in your life, and in the times that we're living in right now, that is a very important time because there are those that don't have a job. 
Those don't know where the meal, next meal may come from, where their finances are going to come from, or what their financial outlook and the future may contain. That becomes a Goliath in their life because things look pretty bleak and pretty dim. Or maybe, again, it's that person that has a way of getting under your skin. Have you ever had an individual like that? You just don't know what to do? Uh, there are things you would like to say, but you know that it wouldn't be very Christian to say it. But there, it comes to the point that you begin to wallow in that sense of that, that rejection or the sense of disappointment, and that individual comes to loom big in your mind. That becomes a Goliath in your life. You see, the truth of the matter is this, is that all of us have had Goliaths in our life. Maybe this morning there are those that have a Goliath in your life and maybe you're in your home or you're in another place where you might be and you could say, yeah, Pastor, I, I relate to that. There's a situation in my life right now. I don't know how to handle it. I don't know what to do. You know, when we don't know what to do, that's when we can lean on God. Jehoshaphat said, I don't know what to do, but my eyes are upon you. It's speaking to Jesus and to God, and, and my eyes are upon you. And that's what we want to look at in our message this morning. Of all of the battles in the Bible, I look at the battle of the wall at the wall of Jericho. I look at the battle, other battles that the Israelites may have gone through. This is probably one of the most famous battles within the entire Bible. The scene of the, the battle was in the Valley of Elah. And what really makes this battle so interesting is not due to the vastness of the battle or the ferocity of the two armies. You see, the two armies that were going at one against the other is the army of the children of Israel against the armies of the, Phil of the Philistines. They were facing each other. But that isn't really what is so intriguing about this situation. Is It was not necessarily only a battle between the new two nations, but it became a battle between two people. It became a battle between David and the giant Goliath. And in our text this morning, we see Goliath making a challenge to the Israelite army. And reading from 1 Samuel chapter 17, beginning with verse 4, we read, And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, when I read that, I know that he was a pretty good-sized guy. When I was looking back and giving it some consideration and studying about how tall Goliath was, one commentator said he was nine feet nine inches. He would have been the starting center of any basketball team. He wouldn't have even had to jump. He would have just been able to stand flat-footed. And so here's Goliath, this huge individual that was nine feet tall. And then if that wasn't uh, uh, enough, is you look at the garment or the armor that he was wearing. It said he had a bronze helmet on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. And a shield bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man who you yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But... If I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be my servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and they were greatly 
afraid. Here was the challenge of this gigantic individual saying, send one man who will come and face me in a battle. If he wins, we become your servants. If I win, you become our servants. You see, there are times in life that we all face the giants at some point. But when this happens, what do we do? Do we become like the children of Israel? And what the children of Israel, you find them doing is they were succumbing to the area in the emotion of fear. They were trembling. They were scared to death. They didn't know what to do because they knew that in their own power and in their own ability and even in their own ingenuity, they wouldn't be able to come against and conquer the adversary, Goliath. And so they became fearful of what to do. But the thing that we have to do when we come into the failing and the emotions of fear and the emotions of doubt, the emotions of, of, of any kind of de decisions that we must make is we must remember first of all and foremost of all is that you and me have the Holy Spirit abiding in us. We have the power of the Holy Spirit in us. And what does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? He came to give power. And ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. You will receive power. The Bible tells us that we have not been given a spirit again to fear, but we have been given a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. But here we find the account in the scriptures of Goliath fighting against the armies of Israel. Now let's jump down to 1 Samuel chapter 14 and begin reading with verse 41. The Bible tells us that David took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag. But look, so the Philistine came and began drawing near to David and the man who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and he saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good looking. So the Philistine said to David, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword, with the spear, and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you, and this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistine to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all of this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or spear, for the battle is the Lord's. Now note, the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. So it was when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David that David hurried and ran to the enemy to meet the Philistine. Then David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead so that the stone, stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood over the Philistine, took his sword and drew it out of the sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. I always am intrigued by this account. Here was Goliath, nine foot tall. Here was David, nothing but a shepherd boy. 
Here was Goliath arrayed in his armor and with his javelin and his spear, with his armor bearer, his heart or his helmet of bronze. And here he stood before David the shepherd boy. And David didn't stand with a slip with a javelin or a sword. He stood with a sling and a bag with five stones. What chance did David have in this battle? But what do we find David doing? David did not cower in fear, but he ran toward the enemy. Did you catch that in the scripture? David was not captivated by fear. He did not wallow. He did not shy back in any way. But the Bible says David ran toward Goliath. He was anxious to meet the enemy in the battle because he knew that the battle was the Lord's. You know, you look at that and you see the armor of Goliath versus the sling of David. You would almost come to the point of saying that would be like shooting a battleship with a BB gun because that's the way it appeared. But there was one thing that the Philistines were unaware of or did not acknowledge of the existence of. The one thing that motivated David to follow and to share, to run toward Goliath, it was not necessarily the sling in his hand. The thing that motivated David to do what he did was the presence of God. And that same presence is with you when you face your giants, when you come against the opposition in your life. May the presence of God rise up within your life and you don't have to cower. You don't have to retreat. You can go toward the battle because you can know that the battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. And so when we face the giant that life throws at us, there are three things that I want to share with you very quickly that we must remember to do. Number one, we need to be focused on the presence of God. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17 says, The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. What this is saying in Zephaniah is that God's presence is always with us. And he glories over us. He rejoices over us with gladness. He, will, he quiets us in his love. And when we come against the Goliaths in our lives, what we must be careful that we focus upon is not the Goliath, but we focus upon the ever-abiding presence of a holy God who said, I will be with you. The battle is not yours. The battle belongs to me, and my presence will be with you always. You will never be alone. I will be with you at all times, even unto the end of the age. God's presence is always with us. So where do we look in the time of battle? When Goliath begins to approach, Goliath begins to defy God, defy us, defy anything that we would try to do for God, telling us that we can't do it, telling us that we're not qualified, that we don't have what it takes to do it, but we can look in the face of Goliath because we're not facing and we're not focusing upon Goliath. We are casting our gaze unto Jesus. The writer of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice what the writer says, looking unto Jesus. You see, the objects that we look at are going to be the big objects that we attend to. If we are looking through the eyes of Jesus, the problems will be minimal. But if we look at Jesus through the eyes, if we look at Jesus through the problem, we find the problem is pretty large. They become a Goliath to us. And so he says, looking unto Jesus, that is where we must focus. Our attention is upon the presence of the Lord. His promises are given to us of his presence. 
And what we must do is we must focus on the promises that he has given to us. Joshua chapter 1 verse 9, and this is a portion of scripture that I have come to appreciate so very much. I remember uh, some years ago, several years ago, in fact, when I was elected the first time to serve as a sectional presbyter of our section in North Dakota, I was scared to death. I, I didn't feel qualified. I didn't feel like I, that was where I should be at all. And I remember that there was a letter that I received that spoke volumes into my life. It was from our, our district, our assistant district superintendent at that time, Brother Ted Easton. And he wrote me a letter and he said this. And he said exactly what God spoke to Joshua. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And I took that challenge of the being a presbyter, served in that position for 12 years with that in mind that I may not feel qualified and I may not be qualified, but I know that my focus is not upon the issues that we face. My focus is upon the God who is a God of all things that said, I'll be with you. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed, for I will be with you wherever you go. We must focus on the presence of God. Second of all, we must be fearless in the power of God. We must be fearless in the power of God. I said earlier, a text that is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power of love and of a sound mind. And maybe you're facing a Goliath right now and there's some fear that is beginning to build in your life, not knowing what to expect, not knowing what to do, but you can recognize the power of God within your life and you can be fearless in God's power because he has given you not that spirit of fear, but he has given you power of love and of a sound mind. And what is so awesome about that idea is that God is not just some little God that we serve. He is not just some little being that we reverence and that we honor, but we serve a God who is omnipotent. We have a God who can do all things, and he does all things well. The Bible says he is the Lord, the God of all flesh, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that is too hard for him. If you are involved in facing a Goliath, I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you. Look to Jesus. Look to him as the author and the finisher of your faith. But I also want to challenge you to be fearless in the power of God. Because God said, I will not let you go. I will not fail you. I will be with you. And my God who has said that to you and he has said that to me is a God who is omnipotent. He is a God who is almighty. He is a God who is all powerful. And what is cool about this whole issue is he's working in us. He's working in us. Can you grasp a hold of that this morning? That God... The God omnipotent, the God almighty is working in your life. He's working in my life. We're not alone. He is with us. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, beginning with verse 19, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all and all. But he said it is the power of God that works in us, the mighty power of God who is available in us, doing in us and through us what is according to his plan and in according to his purpose. You see, it is God's power working in us. 
Because if we were to try to do it in our own abilities, in our own resources, we would be destined to failure. But when we can go with the knowledge of the power of God and we can face the Goliath without any fear, we can know that God is going to be with us. And not only is he going to be with us, he's going to be empowering us. He is within us, working on our behalf. You see, the Bible said if that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwell in you, he will quicken your mortal body. And the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is a spirit that now abides in you that gives us the power and the ability to tread upon the heads of of scorpions and of serpents that we can come over victorious in all of the assaults and the assailment of the enemy because God God is working in us. It is God's power in us. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work in us. But let's turn that around and make it a personal claim that we can do these things and God is working in us, giving us that ability that he is going to do exceedingly and abundantly all that I ask or think according to the power that works in me. The power that works in me. I'm not alone. I stand girded by the power of the Holy Spirit with the wisdom of God that is going to be given and we can come out in victorious and the enemy that we face can become like a giant that David faced. That we can come in victory because David was not fearless, was fearless because of the power of God. And last of all, be fervent, be passionate in God's praise. I can't overemphasize the importance of praise. Praise is so valuable. I have set a pattern of prayer in my own life. I read it some time ago in one of my devotions, and I I established this as a, as a, a form that I follow. When I begin my prayer time, I begin by worshiping God because I want my mind to be focused on who God is, that I come into the presence of God and I could say that, God, you are the creator and the sustainer of the universe. You have put the stars into their place. You have hung the world in its existence. And now I am coming before the God, the creator. I, the created, are coming to God, the created creator. And so I can focus upon God and his power, God and what he is doing, and I can worship him. And then I begin to praise him for what he has done. I thank him for the many blessings that he has bestowed upon me. I couldn't begin to count the blessings and the, the, the things that God has done on my behalf. And I begin to thank him for these things that he has done. But I always begin with the ultimate, and that is I thank God for salvation. I thank God that I can know that I at one time were held in the clutches of sin, alienated away from God, but now through the blood of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary, that now I have been brought into a position of fellowship with God. And I can praise him for what he has done for me. And I praise him for the material things. I praise him for my family. I praise him for my church family that he has given us the honor and the privilege to be a part of in these years that we have served in this this great body of believers. I praise him for what he's done to us physically as we've undergone physical situations in our lives, and yet God has brought us through. I praise him for what he has done for us materially. He has provided the homes that we live in. He has provided us the things that we have need of because he knows all the things that we need, and I praise him for what he has done for me materially. Praise is a valuable tool in the arsenal of our prayer time. The psalmist says in Psalm 103, Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all our sins, and he heals all our diseases, 
who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What does he say? Praise the Lord. Church, I want to encourage you. When you're facing that Goliath, praise God. Praise God, not for the giant, but for the God that we serve. The God who is on our side, the God who is in control, praise him. And you will be amazed what that praise will do. It will focus, it will center the focus of your attention away from the Goliath and begin to focus upon the blessings and the goodness of God. I was thinking of David when they were coming into Jerusalem after they, they had recaptured the ark. And there was a, a great time of celebration, exuberance, because they were walking in the presence of God, which was the ark, was a, was a sign of God's presence. And when they were coming into Jerusalem, you see David, who he was lost in praise. He began to dance. He began to sing. He began to praise. Why? Because he was in the presence of God. And when we're in the presence of God, of which we are every day of our life, we know the presence of God so we can just say, God, I want to praise you. I want to praise you. I want to thank you. I want to give you the glory and the honor which you are so worthy to receive. But there are times in our lives that we go through some hardships. We go through some issues. We face our Goliaths. But I think of the Goliath that Paul and Silas was facing in the Philippian jail. The Bible says that they were, they were tortured, they were disciplined, they were given a beating by the whips of the guards of the prison. They were put in stocks, they were set into a prison cell. But what do you find Paul and Silas doing? They're not saying, oh, woe is me. God, why did you allow this to happen to me? After all, I'm serving you. I'm doing what you want me to do. And I've been called by you. And I just want to, to see your blessings upon my life. And, and so, God, I don't know why this is happening. And I feel, feel defeated. I feel discouraged. I feel depressed by what's happening. But you know, the thing about it is, that's not where you find Paul and Silas. The Bible says that in the midst of what they were going through, they were giving praise unto God. They were offering praise and thanksgiving unto God because the trial that they were involved in was not going to change the nature of God. God was the same then. He's going to be the same in the beginning. Is the same forever. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And Paul and Silas said, I have seen God when I've been on the mountaintops. I have seen God when I've been in the valleys. And I've seen God when I have good times. I've seen him in the bad times. And I'm going to praise him in spite of what comes my way. Because my situations might change. My problems might change. But my God never changes. So I can praise him for who he is and give glory and honor to his holy name name. And the Bible says that they were singing at midnight and praying hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And then all of a sudden, miraculously, the power of God came down upon that place. And the gates of the jail swung open and set the captive free. But they told the Philippian jailer, do no harm to yourself. We're still here. And they led the Philippian jailer and his family into a saving knowledge of Jesus. Jesus Christ. Why? Because they praised God in spite of the situation that they were in. They praised God when they were facing Goliath within their lives. And when they praised God, the praises of God resounded and it opened the prison doors. You see, today you may be captive. You may be enslaved by the prison doors of a situation that you may be finding yourself in. You may feel like it all is lost. But I want to assure you today, friend, if you will give praise unto God and let God begin to minister into your heart, the prison doors will swing open and you will be set free because you will acknowledge the presence and the power of God. Because one thing is certain, 
Praise honors and it pleases God. It pleases God. God desires the praises of his people. You see, one thing that we recognize about praise is he's going to receive praise one way or another. Because if we don't praise him, someone else or something else will. In fact, the Bible tells us in the Gospel of Luke, Luke chapter 19, verse 40, when all of the disciples, as they were coming into Jerusalem at the time of the triumphal entry, and all of the disciples were uh, saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And the enemy came to, the, to Jesus, and they, he said, quiet him down. Quiet him down. They're, they're a little bit fanatical. You know, they're getting a little bit too loud. It's making us nervous because this noise is, is not, uh, not usual. And so we, we want you to quiet them down and tell them to cease giving their praise and to cease giving them their honor. But look what Jesus said to them. He said in verse 40 of chapter 19 of Luke, I will tell you that if these should keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. You see what he was saying? If they don't do it, nature will. Nature will, and I have come to the position in my life, I don't want to be outdone by a stone. I don't want to be outdone by nature because I've got a reason to praise God. I've got a reason to rejoice in the gladness of God. And if it causes me to dance, so be it. If it causes me to shout, so be it. If it causes me to rejoice, so be it. Because I know that I have a God that is worthy to be praised. And praise will give me help in the strength of facing my Goliath. You see, David did all three of these things leading up to his fight with Goliath. David, of all people, were most unlikely. He was a little shepherd boy. And Saul says, David, you need an armor. And so he said, have my armor. Brave Saul, here, you use my armor. So David put on the armor of Saul, and he said, no, nah, no, nah, I, I, can't, I can't wear this armor. I haven't tested it because I have my shield in the, in the things of God. I have my position in God, and my sling has proven to be true because God, the God that I now serve, is a God who delivered me out of the mouth of the lion and the bear, and he'll deliver me out of the hand of Goliath. You see, that's what motivated David to fight the fight because he had known that he could focus on the presence of God. He knew that he could focus on the power of God. He knew that he could focus upon the things that God has done in giving him praise and honor. And he had all his faith in the presence and in the power of God. And David gave praise when he had conquered the enemy. David, again, he didn't shy back from the enemy and wonder, what in the world did I get myself into now? How am I ever going to overcome? No, David knew in whom he had believed, and he was convinced that he had committed unto him against that which he had given that day. So David went in the power of the might of God with praise, with thanksgiving, full of faith, and David conquered the enemy. You see, today this entire story is not about a little shepherd boy who beat a huge giant. This is a story about God. This is a story about what God desires to do in your life and what he desires to do in my life. The point of this battle is not between David and Goliath. The point of this battle is that there is a God who rescues. There is a God who will fight our battles for us. And there is a God who is bigger than any giant you and I will ever face. Father, today we thank you for the encouragement that you bring to us through your word. That God, we know that you are with us and we know that you are bigger than any battle that we will ever confront that you are bigger than any situation that we will ever have to go through and that we can focus upon you, that we can focus upon the reality of your presence and of your power 
and then we can also focus upon the reality that we give praise unto you for what you have done. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak into the hearts and the lives of your people today. And maybe there are some that have listened to this message today that are sitting in a place of facing a Goliath in their lives, a Goliath that no one really understands. No one can ever, really ever do anything to really satisfy and to ease that which they are confronted with. But I know that we serve a God who is able, a God who can do exceedingly and abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so I pray that you administer to those that may be going through situations in their life and they don't know what to do, they don't know which way to go, they don't know which way to turn. But God, I pray that you would speak indelibly into their hearts and just simply say, I am with you. I'm with you. And God, maybe there are those who really don't know you in a personal way. And they would desire to find this hope that we have just expressed in the times of the battle to know that you go with us. And I pray that you, by your Holy Spirit, would speak into their lives and draw them unto yourself that they might find that hope and know that the God of David is our God. He's the God who we serve. And so, Lord, we thank you for your word that is true. Heaven and earth is going to pass away, but your word will never pass away. It is true. It has been established in heaven, and it is given for our benefit, for our encouragement, for our good. And now, Lord, let it be that in our lives, we pray. Give us a great week. I pray, God, that you would bring us together next Sunday as we come together in an open church that we might be able to just enjoy your blessings as we come together. And now, God, we ask you to be with us, guide and direct us, and may our lives be found in you. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. This morning, we do want to remind you of the importance of your giving. We are dependent upon your giving. We know that we have been several weeks without being able to come together, and uh, that has been miserable enough. And we were looking forward to getting back together, of which we'll be doing next Sunday. We would like to say that it is Father's Day. And in keeping with our Father's Day tradition, my wife Kathy will be speaking uh, next Sunday. And so you won't want, won't, won't want to miss that. We want to remind you of our giving. And, and um, we appreciate so very much your faithfulness. You have been above and beyond faithful. And we want to say thank you. And we know God's blessings will richly be upon you as well. We say thank you. But we give you av the various avenues of to ways of giving. We give you the traditional ways in which you can send a check, bring a check into the church office, and that will go in into that uh, part of your giving of your tithes and of your offerings. Then there is a website by online going onto the church's website. There's a for the smartphone uh, text give and to the number of 833-394-8007 and then there is the Tidely app all you do is di uh, download that app and uh, set up the uh, the um, program and you will be set to go and so we want to encourage you be liberal in your giving the Bible tells us God loves a cheerful giver and if we give bountifully we're going to reap bountifully if we give sparingly, we will reap sparingly. And we know that God is faithful. So we'll see you Sunday. We're looking forward to seeing you. We, it was such a treat to see you last Sunday. And we're going to be looking forward to next Sunday. God bless you. We want you to know we love you. We appreciate you. And we thank God every day for you. God bless you.